Welcome everybody. This is your parliament and it's fantastic to see you all here. Um, and it's a real delight to be joined by very special people on this table, including my predecessor, Baroness Lynn Featherston, uh, and also who's the spokesperson in the House of Lords for the Liberal Democrats on uh, sustainability and green economics. And we've got an economist here who in a minute is going to talk to his work and his report. And of course we have the wonderful Fran um, Boat who brought this meeting together and who works for Positive Money. And as many of you know who are members of Positive Money, the purpose of Positive Money is to try and look at how the economy can work for people much more than just serving itself. Um, we've also just been joined by Lord Devon who has had the same problems as all of us getting into Fortress Westminster this morning. Um, and of course, our Shadow Cabinet member, Barry Gardner, who will also um, speak to many of the aspects in this report. It's fantastic to have you all here. We know that after the last 10 years of real um, sort of existential crisis for the financial services area, and as a London MP, I feel that very keenly. So whether that's the LIBOR scandal or um, the fixing of foreign exchange rates, or the closure of bank branches, or the bank fees which you may be charged because but you're not even sure what they're for, or the fact that some people can't even open a bank account because they don't have the correct identification. There's so many problems with modern banking and the financial services area. And uh, that's why it's fantastic to have groups like Positive Money. There's two or three other all-party groups who are doing similar work on the financial services sector. But this is very novel, this work, because it actually tries to introduce sustainability and how we promote um, a, a more positive environment. And that's why it's fantastic to have so many experts on sustainability and the environment and to talk carefully about how we put um, green uh, economics at the heart of what we do. And I'm very excited as a Labour backbencher that we're actually looking at some of those really difficult questions, for example, on energy. You know, is it much better, which I think it is, to put more finance earlier into um, the sustainability questions on wind, far wind farms, for example, rather than necessarily looking at the extreme cost that it is um, for doing away with nuclear waste, which we still haven't solved. I noticed in um, the weekend's papers that there's a, a large debate about what we do with nuclear waste, which of course is a big problem for us here. Um, and for those in the regions. So with no further ado, Fran, I'm going to stop so that mm -hmm. others can start and just to say how fantastic it is to have this really groundbreaking work and to start thinking um, much more clearly about the importance of the green economy to all of our futures, to our children, uh, and also uh, to hopefully getting a more um, responsible financial sector. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. So I'm the director of Positive Money, and I'd just like to invite if any of the speakers that have just arrived want to join the panel now. It's going to be me for a couple of minutes and then Rob. So decide if you want to sit there or stay where you are. Very. I think we've got everyone now, which is exciting. Um, and I think the fact that we've got uh, you know, a fantastic panel of speakers, it shows it really is a, a truly cross-party conversation, um, which is what it needs to be, um, climate change in the Bank of England. Unfortunately, Michael Sheeran, who's a senior advisor at the Bank of England on green, um, on, on green issues on climate change, couldn't be here today, uh, but we've got a lot of expertise. And I just also want to thank Catherine for hosting. Um, it is quite a radical conversation, but it's one that needs to be had. In October, we're expecting the UN to announce that we're going to be locked into 1.5 degrees global temperature rise by the 2040s. Uh, this will definitely have a devastating effect on food supply on the whole planet, on our ability to access clean water, and the ability to stop deadly diseases. So climate change is already underway, uh, and we know to mitigate it, or at least adapt, uh, we need to mobilise finance. That's just a fact. Uh, central banks sit at the heart of the financial system. Therefore, if we really want to transform our economy, then it makes sense that central banks have to be part of the conversation and actually have to lead the way. But the good thing is that the conversation is accelerating fast. Uh, I think you know, the idea of, of launching a paper on the Green Bank of England even a year ago would, would quite frankly be mildly absurd, but that just shows how fast things are changing. Uh, and I think that is because it's quite clear that the kind of economic consensus of the last few decades is breaking down. And previously, um, kind of radical 
conversations are now becoming much more acceptable. Um, and that's because people are understanding that we need to uh, change fast. We can no longer continue with our economic institutions that have essentially operated in isolation from society's priorities, continuing to do so. Um, those days are over. And I think also an increasing openness does come from, um, at least in part, you know, the political shocks that continue in economic decline, things like Trump, Brexit, increasing inequality and secular stagnation, uh, and to top that off with obviously the threat of climate change. And just to, just to finish on, on a kind of radical thought, you know, the Bank of England was founded in 1694 to, to fight a war, essentially. And I think climate change is clearly the biggest challenge or war of our time, so it needs to be considered. Thanks, Brian. And I'll hand over to Rob. Thanks, Brian. OK. Well, thank you very much for the introductions. And um, thank you very much for coming to hear about these two, well, the climate change and central banking, two quite seemingly incongruous topics. but. Um, of course, I hope you'll leave here today convinced that this is no way, in no way a side issue, but rather part of a fundamental and very necessary rethink about how we make economic policy and shape our financial system in light of the climate crisis that we all face. Um, and I'm very grateful that we're joined by elected policymakers here today, because although the Bank of England is independent, what central banking is and what it tries to achieve is really um, an outcome of political design. And the vessel for that design is the central bank's mandate, which we see is at the core of what we're really proposing here today. But um, I'll follow up on some of the remarks Brian just made first and answer why on earth should central banks care about climate change? Well, the case can be put in two arguments. Really. The first has to do with financial risk. So the process is inherent to climate change. Are really going to introduce new forms of financial risk to the economic system to expose the financial system to these new forms. Now that goes for physical damage from weather, like floods, which have caused billions of pounds worth of damage in the UK alone in recent years, but also the way society responds. So that goes for policy, which might put a tax on high carbon emitting firms, but also sudden changes in valuations and changes in the energy grid, new costs. And we call these kind of transition risks, risks which are going to influence the valuation of companies. And especially that second type of risk, transition risk, really has the potential to be systemic because it affects companies all the way across the UK economy. So this is the proportion of companies in the FTSE 100, so some of the largest companies in the UK economy, and, and relatively high carbon sectors. And we're looking at this because uh, Bank of England Governor Mark Carney actually pointed to <coughs> these values in September 2015 as a reason to care about this risk argument for central banks to be concerned that the risk of climate change might impact on financial stability. Um, but unfortunately, that value has only gone up over time. That's mostly due to developments in energy markets, probably, but um, unfortunately it's occurred. And that means that the size of these companies, the value of risk from transition rates, um, is more, more, more value is tied up in the companies that uh, really exposed to this kind of transition risk. And the size of these companies echoes through the financial system. Because in the report, we collate the findings of several different NGOs which look at bank lending um, and show that banks are actually quite woefully unprepared for kind of how this is going to impact on the system. Because they're still making loans to projects that are going to have high carbon in intensity. Um, and they're going to be committed to those assets in several years' time when decarbonisation really ought to be underway. But it's not just banks, it's also other kind of asset holders. So pension funds and insurance firms and actually the Bank of England itself. So the central bank ought to be taking steps to mitigate, pardon me, mitigate this risk and um, reduce the exposure in the system to this kind of risk. Now there's another argument that we use to say why central banks should care. And we call it the investment argument because it's fundamentally about investing in the low carbon economy. Um, we know that climate change is an enormous economic externality. So the costs it imposes are on society, and private actors that generate those costs don't really feel it so much. And the same for benefits of green investment. And that means that we see far less green investment than is socially optimal than we'd like to see. 
Um, and that goes for resilience, like flood defences, but also reducing emissions, like renewable. And the shortfall between what we'd like to see and where we're actually at is called the Green Investment Gap, and that is billions of pounds, trillions of dollars worldwide every year. Um, and evidence, recent evidence figures show that in the UK, uh, over the past couple of years, the investment in clean energy has fallen quite precipitously. So this is really relevant to this country. Um, and the investment argument says that the central bank sits at the centre of the monetary and financial system and therefore has, has enormous resources at its, at its disposal, as we've seen over past years, and therefore should really incentivise, push that system, help galvanise investment in low carbon infrastructure. And so the Bank of England isn't actually unaware of all this. Um, the bank is to be praised for bringing the climate issue to the attention of the central bank community internationally. Um, as I mentioned, Governor Mark Carney has given several high profile speeches on this uh, since 2015 and um, after that as well. And the bank really leads on the research agenda in this area as well. But the problem is that um, officials of the Bank of England still see the entire climate change issue through the lens of financial stability and risk. So they focus on the risk argument and they actually Really, if you get into conversation, they reject the investment argument as somehow kind of political or partisan outside of their legitimate purpose. But we think that leaves several problems. So firstly, there's then no place for longer run effects on the economy and the financial system. All the risks I've been talking about manifest are actually quite long time horizons, longer than most policymakers are thinking under. And Governor Carney actually said this in himself in his 2015 speech, that once climate change becomes a defining issue for financial stability, it may already be too late. He called this the tragedy of the horizon, and that tragedy is that we have a central bank that sees its role as protecting, monitoring, safeguarding a system where all of those companies we just looked at are extremely exposed to risk and are going to compromise the long-run viability of not just the economy, but also our society and our planet. Financial, financial stability pardon, then comes to look quite incoherent over time under that, under that argument. But that's not the only kind of incoherence that the bank suffers from. Um, some great work by researchers at the London School of Economics showed that the carbon, the, sorry, corporate bond purchase scheme, um, which is part of the Bank of England's quantitative easing program, has been skewed towards high carbon sectors. And that's unintentional, it's a product of the um, design of the program, but it's relative to their contribution to the UK economy, high carbon savings have benefited from bond purchases and books and monetary policy. Um, now that means that monetary policy has been actively boosting these very companies that we've just heard from the financial stability concern are systemically are, are contributing to systemic risk. And so the bank's monetary policy and its financial stability concerns are incoherent across themselves. And the final problem rests in a crucial element of the monetary system that we know today. The size of the money supply grows when private banks make loans. Now that privilege creates a market failure in the market for new credit. Because banks are incentivized to lend to projects that have a high private return and low private risk. And that skews lending away from green investment because green investment, as we've said, has high social returns and often actually has quite high private risk because of relatively young technologies and the like. So for all these reasons, the bank's stance at the moment seems somehow insufficient. But I said that it's actually aware of some of these problems. On the final point, the bank has actually published evidence about the facts of modern money creation, but it seems yet to make the connection with the climate change issue. So if these problems remain, why does it take a view? Well, the answer you'll always get is actually political. It comes back to the mandate. So the nature of central banking and its objectives is a result of political design. We use the term instrument independence to describe how the bank is, for the most part, able to use its tools, policy tools, to achieve its objectives without political scrutiny, or rather direction. But those goals, those objectives, are set by political leaders. So it requires legislation to actually change the primary objectives of the bank. 
But there is quite a lot of leeway for the Chancellor of the Exchequer to define parameters and actually set how the bank interprets the goals when he or she writes a letter, usually annually, to the key decision-making committees within the bank. And the Bank of England Act in 1998 established this arrangement and gave the bank its first primary objective, which is price stability. That's the inflation target of 2% at the moment that you'll read about in the news. But the bank, as I've said, also has a financial stability objective. So it's concerned to monitor and safeguard the stability of the financial system. That objective is as recent in its current form, is as recent as 2012, um, it, following the crisis, the Bank of England Act was amended by the Financial Services Act. So central banking can change with the times. It's worth briefly also touching on climate policy in the UK, um, which has mostly been insulated from democratic politics and from the electoral cycle successfully by the Climate Change Act of 2008, which established the Committee on Climate Change, which is an independent advisory body which um, scrutiny or looks at the required investment to meet emissions reduction targets and also adaptation goals themselves mandated by the Climate Change Act. It's a legal requirement in the UK to reduce emissions to certain carbon budgets every five years. And the Committee on Climate Change advises the government how to do that. So I hope that partly dispels the notion that um, managing climate change is somehow a partisan thing and, and, and unsuited to expert guidance. I'll come back to that point briefly in a minute. But first, what are we actually proposing? Well, there are several policies that the bank can adopt to support the low carbon transition. And it helps to work in the bottom up with these policies, thinking about the tools that the bank can use and then in what contexts it would decide to use them. Because at the moment, the bank's tools, as we talk about with the QE program, are somehow unsuited to, to taking sustainability in mind. Um, and we discussed these in more detail in the report, but they include guidelines and financial regulation, which would shift bank lending and capital market investment uh, to more sustainable investments. And monetary policy itself could be made more green in order to take account of the extra financial risk from high carbon assets. And instead, it would direct investment, both private or public, at the green investment gap. And I should say that decisions over where the money goes, if this is public investment, would still remain in the hands of democratically elected policymakers. What we want to do here is enable the bank to provide the funding in the first place, especially in times of recession, that can then be used to fund green investment. This isn't about making spending decisions outside of democratic control. But it wouldn't be clear to the bank's decision makers when to use these tools unless it had a mandate to go with them. So what we've done here is we've mapped out the interior institutions of the bank. We won't dwell on them for too long in the interest of brevity. But the process we're proposing starts with government <coughs> departments. So base the Department for Business, Energy, and Industrial Strategy, and the Treasury should really review the framework, the monetary policy framework for the bank. The Treasury did this before in 2013, and it can <coughs> do it again. It did it then because of the context of the recent financial crisis. We're proposing it to take account of the climate. The department for the base is concerned with um, carbon emissions and reductions in carbon emissions. That's why we propose they work in conjunction. Next, the chancellor could actually make quite simple and feasible alterations to the traditional mandates, remits, for the key decision-making committees, the monetary policy committee and the financial policy committee which I've put here in bold, um, standing out from the traditional mandate. So you can see that we've got the price stability, but then we've proposed the Monetary Policy Committee taking account of the trade-offs inherent with climate sustainability when it's trying to achieve its price stability objective. And um, I'll ask you if you've got some questions on this, we'll, we can go into them in the Q&A, but they won't be too long. Um, the point is that if these changes were made, and the tools that we briefly discussed were added to the bank's toolkit, then we'd see a Bank of England that's able to achieve win-wins, so it could secure macroeconomic and financial stability at a net benefit to the planet. If you put it this way, suppose there's a financial crisis in the next two or three years, which by some accounts is extremely likely. Instead of a decade, another decade lost 
wasted criticizing monetary policymakers and the financial system for failing to learn the lessons of the past. We'd have reduced the risk to the financial system and to our society from companies sitting on billions of high carbon fossil fuel assets and from the damage from weather like floods. And we'd also see higher levels of investment in green sectors which have loads of potential for growth and for jobs. This is really about putting sustainability right at the heart, at the core of our macroeconomic policy framework. So I hope that after what you heard today, um, you'll share that vision. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a tough gig, isn't it? You, you're speaking between Rob Macquarie and Lord Deben, um, which means that you're speaking between somebody who knows everything there is to know about the subject that we're discussing, namely Rob, uh, and somebody who knows everything that there is to know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, give me, give me, give me space and patience. Um, no, it's not often that I begin the day by quoting Her Majesty the Queen. Um, but as we consider this morning's conversation um, about how we can hardwire sustainability into the Bank of England, I am reminded of that story when Her Majesty uh, visited the LSE. And this was just after the global financial crisis of 2007, 2008. And as she often does, the, Her Majesty spoke on behalf of all of us uh, when she famously asked the professors, um, why did we not see it coming? And her question still resonates, actually with an anger held by many people in this country today. How could we not have noticed that our markets were failing before our eyes? And today, a decade later, the recession has left our country with a deep anxiety about the financial system. And we mouth these platitudes, saying we must never be caught unawares again when an economic catastrophe is imminent. And yet we face the economic catastrophe of climate change. So the question that our children will be asking us is not the one that the Her Majesty asked of the professors. They'll ask us, given that you saw it coming, why on earth did you not take all the necessary steps to avert it? The economic crisis of climate change is markedly different to the recession. We've seen it coming for some time now. The gradual but extreme breakdown of our global climate is all 
already, without doubt, one of the greatest systemic risks that our financial uh, economy faces to its stability. And that's, that's not being alarmed. Um, it's what business leaders, it's what economists have been saying for <coughs> many years. At Davos, year after year, the World Economic Forum publishes its reports unequivocally pointing to climate change as the biggest threat to our prosperity. And it's now 12 years since the then lowly Nick Stern, now the lowly <laughs> Lord, described climate change in his review as the greatest market failure the world <clears throat> has ever seen. So with a new systemic threat to our financial system, we must now begin to once again undergo the journey of redesigning the financial system to tackle it in much the same way that we did after 2008. So back then, the recession required a radical overhaul of our financial system. We took measures to ensure that in the future, our economy would be resilient to the pressures that had brought it to its knees. We raised capital requirements on banks to ensure that they could withstand dramatic losses. We stress-tested lenders so we can be confident that they can handle recessions. And at the center of major reforms like these was the total redesign of the Bank of England. Parliament beefed up our central bank in 2012 so it could play a more strongly interventionist role in tackling risks to the economy. With the creation of the Financial Policy Committee, the bank has an authority capable of taking a broad, forward look across the economy to monitor risks and keep them in check across the whole financial system. That's the deal. So in the same way, catastrophic climate change requires a similar wide-ranging response across our financial institutions. We've got to transform every element of our financial system to ensure it can withstand the strains that the climate crisis is exerting. But more than that, we must also ensure it plays a full role in supporting the decarbonization of our economy. Lord Eden's Committee on Climate Change estimates that the total investment needed to meet our fifth carbon budget is 22 billion pounds a year. That's about 1% of GDP. So we must also urgently mobilize our financial system to unlock those enormous financial flows to the green economy if we're to stand any chance of keeping to our commitments that we made in the Paris Agreement. So we're in the embryonic stages of this transformation. The Task Force for Climate-Related <coughs> Disclosures has, of course, been leading the way to make the implications of long-term climate change transparent in the financial sector. And asset owner-led activities like the TPI are showing investors how to understand and price in the risk companies face in shifting to a low-carbon economy. And the City of London's Green Finance Initiative has meant that by the end of March this year, 38 green companies had collectively raised 10 billion pounds of green finance, with the square mile now home to a burgeoning market for green bonds. But to develop a resilient, low-carbon society, we can't rely on private sector reforms alone. We've also fundamentally got to change the way our public institutions think and act. And that's why, for example, the Shadow Chancellor, John McDonnell, announced that a future Labour government will extend the OBR's remit to ask them to impede the impact of climate change and environmental damage in its long-term economic forecast. Understanding what climate change means for our economy is essential for the sound management of our public finances. And now it's time for us to explore what climate change means for all of our public institutions. At the heart of our financial system lies the Bank of England, owned by our government to serve the citizens of the UK. And its mandate is to protect and enhance the stability of the financial system of this country. If climate change poses a systemic risk to our finances, then it's surely the duty of the Bank of England to do something about it, to protect our economy from climate change and to accelerate our efforts to tackle that change. 
And this report being launched today is, I think, a, a tremendous starting point for that conversation on how the Bank of England ought to go about fulfilling that mandate. Of course, this isn't to say that the Bank hasn't been paying attention to climate change. Mark Carney has been an absolute pioneer in this field. And, and it's wonderful, actually, as somebody who speaks a lot on climate change, now to be able to go out and say, and of course the governor of the Bank of England backs this up by saying, it, 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 it's great that he's taken that lead. And the TCFD's proposal to <coughs> develop under his chairmanship of the LSB, and he's been instrumental in urging companies to disclose their climate risk exposure. So the bank's public leadership on climate change is something I think that we should applaud. But what this report shows is that there is still greater potential for our central bank to play a greater role in accelerating those efforts. The Bank of England's policy runs counter to the risks it's supposed to be addressing. With its monetary policy interventions and criteria for its corporate bond purchase programs skewed towards higher carbon sectors. And although the Bank of England has been a leading institution in its public endorsement of the TCFD, T TCFD recommendations, um, it's actually yet to lead by example and disclose its own climate risks of assets on its balance sheet. <coughs> so for the Bank of England to play its fullest role in mitigating and adapting to climate change, political will is needed. The report cogently argues that the bank is independent, its mandate, and that of the Financial Policy Committee is fundamentally a political question. And that's why it's so important that we're gathered here today in Parliament to ignite this conversation. What we need is a central <coughs> bank that better understands its critical role in dealing with the <coughs> crisis. The Bank of England has a privileged position in the centre of our economic system. It has the power to enact radical change in our economy, much as it did in the aftermath of the global recession. Back then, in the face of a banking crisis, public institutions bailed out the banking sector. But now, if I can steal your quote, Rob, it's time to bail out the club. Thank you. Okay. Um, but well, I, I uh, want to hear what everybody We've got a, a, a few minutes uh, for a quick uh, Q&A uh, with, with Barry. So if you can put your hands up, I think we've got someone here. Anyone else up here and here? I'll take you three. Uh, yes, please. Sir. Um, Bruce Davis from the Berlin Task on the Mossack and the Green Finance Task Force for the last six months. Um, so I guess the question there is really, do we need an additional remit if one of the statements that came through from the Task Force so was that the world is effectively uninsurable at four degrees. In other words, we won't have an insurance industry. So are we already facing an existential crisis for the financial system? It's not that we can't bail it out, it's actually, it won't exist. Yeah. So um, you know, does that actually sort of heighten the requirement that, from a political perspective, something you know, has to be prodded along? It's almost as if everyone's looking at the elephant and wondering what to do about it, but actually, Thank you. I'll take uh, the other two questions and then let, let Barry answer. Yeah. Uh, thank you. That's not just this next work. I mean, arguably, in order to reduce uh, carbon emissions, what we really need is an excellent financial crisis to impoverish us all. That's what I'm talking about. My point being that at the moment, uh, GDP, the link between GDP and uh, CO2 emission is very close indeed. Tim Jackson, uh, Prosperity Without Growth, argues that you cannot separate the two. I disagree, but given that the Bank of England is uh, talking about GDP in its actions every month, what measures would you take to refine the green product being talked about, an alternative the national product, uh, the notion of whatever it is we measure every month? according to what financial decisions we have, because as far as I can see, the Greens are still pretty fuzzy. Um, I, I think we're, we're going to take questions just for Mary now, because uh, we'll have other 
I will have a chance to do a broader <coughs> Q&A um, later, but he has to rush off. Um, so I think um, we, we may not be able to, to get to the full answer of that <laughs> till later. And the third question, yes. Um, Mervyn King quite often talks about the prisoner's dilemma. In other words, the person from the country which acts first is going to suffer, unless all the other countries decide to do the same. Could you comment on how the prisoner's dilemma affects um, our actions on climate change? Okay. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, Bruce, uh, look, you, you pointed out that this is not just um, uh, a theoretical issue about how we might best go about reforming our financial structures. Um, it's actually an existential threat. Um, and I, I don't think that is in any way at variance with what this report is saying. Um, what the report is saying is that we have to make it clear to the Bank of England that, it's, that it is given a specific mandate, a remit, to tackle these issues in, in every way and not to limit its activity to more conventional risk assessment groups. So, uh, uh, sorry, that's no, a, a horrendous <laughs> paraphrase of, of, of what is a, a very long and very good report. Um, but, but what you've said is, look, a four-degree world, and, and it's all like this bad. What is contained in the report, of course, is um, something that you know is, is there out there in the public domain that Shell and BP are actually planning. Their planning scenarios are for a three to five degree world, precisely the world in which you're saying it's all up the spout anyway. So I, I think you add impetus to the need for this report to be taken seriously in changing what the Bank of England does and how it thinks about what it ought to do. Okay? Dave, um, now you, you talked about, uh, let's have another really good recession, I think, to paraphrase what you said, because that will reduce our emissions and, and, and won't that be a very good thing? Well, I, I think there's probably a number of people in society who wouldn't see it that way. But also, and, and here I will defer to Lord Deepen, who, who will probably be able to, um, to shoot down your argument much better than I. And that is the argument that you put forward about how GDP is always linked to CO2 emissions growth. Because actually, within the UK, and, and goodness, um, uh, Lord Deepen is, is nodding his head and not shaking it, um, in the UK, we have managed over the past decade to do precisely that, or actually the past 20 years to do precisely that. Um, and, and that is really encouraging, that you can increase GDP and reduce CO2 emissions. And that decoupling of production emissions from growth in GDP is something that is absolutely essential because you don't persuade people to change their behaviour, which is fundamentally what we're trying to do, uh, by saying, well, we just want you all to go round wearing sandals and hair shirts. That's not going to cut it for us. Uh, and therefore, that, that link has to be broken. And the encouraging thing is we've managed to show a way in which that can be done. Um, Sir, so I, I thought your name was Mervyn at the beginning, but because you didn't give your name, you talked about right. Mervyn King. Um, uh, so I don't know your name, but you talked about the prisoner's dilemma first mover, well, often people talk about first mover advantage as well. But, you know, I think the, the extraordinarily good thing about where the world is in taking the initiative on climate is that it's not just us. Um, and what happened within the Paris Agreement um, was we moved from a world where Previously, if you remember back to Copenhagen in what, 2008, was it 2009? Nine, that long ago. In, in Copenhagen, we thought we could fix the problem by wagging our finger, by, by us, the people who knew, telling everybody else in the world, you've got to do this, and you've got to do that, and you've got to do the next thing. And that's why Copenhagen fell apart and was a disaster. And what change between Copenhagen and Paris, quite remarkably, was that people started saying, no, we've got to build this from the bottom up. We've got to all be engaged in this. 
and, and what we need to do is we need to see what the voluntary contributions of each country are, what, which eventually became the INDCs, and the intended nationally determined contributions. We've got to see if what it is that each country is prepared to do for the extent of the problem that it recognizes. And that's why Paris worked, because it actually gave a structure, a framework, within which everybody could say, well, I'll bring this to the party. And we know that all of us doing that has meant we don't have enough at the party. We haven't got enough voluntary contributions. And that's why there is still this gap to where, from where we are, or where we promised, to where we need to be. But that's what the ratcheting mechanism in Paris is supposed to address. And that's why this year is so critical. And it's why it is a disgrace that politicians are not going to the COP this year, because they don't want to face up to their responsibilities to actually ratchet up their nationally determined contributions, which for the most part, they haven't even yet shown how they're going to fulfill. Thank you very much. Uh, and on that note, we'll have to say uh, goodbye. No, no, I, I, I'm going oh, to sit down there and listen to Lord Eben before I go. OK, well, we're going to have Lord Deben's um, uh, response. Um, Lord Deben, uh, of course, is uh, speaking to us as chairman of the Climate Change Committee. Um, uh, he is also, as we know, he's, he's a, a, a Conservative peer, and he was... Uh, He's regularly cited, in fact, as one of the, the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, environment ministers um, that the country has ever had. Um, but he is chair of the uh, Committee on Climate Change, which, of course, was set up under the Climate Change Act, which is 10 years old um, this year, um, and still an enormously important act um, as it uh, bound uh, uh, governments uh, beyond their term in office to think of carbon budgets. Um, and uh, we, we've uh, had reference to the Climate Change Act uh, in the report here, of course, and how it can be used in this context and viewed in this context. So, Lord Deben, if you'd like to give us your uh, response to the report, please. We're very anxious to hear it. Thank you. <coughs> well, thank you very much, and I'm very pleased that this event is happening. I think uh, it is a crucial one. But it is uh, important, I think, to start by saying that one of the problems that we've had is that the issues of climate change uh, have been thought of as if they apply only to certain bits of government. For a long time, it's been uh, uh, climate change and energy, uh, climate change and uh, the way in which we have to reduce our direct emissions. So I want to start by saying that I think the best insight into climate change comes from the Pope's uh, Laudato Si, when he talks about climate change as a symptom of what we've done to the world. I, I think it's a crucial way of thinking about climate change. Because once one sees it as a symptom, then one recognises how fundamentally it ties in with all those other issues and it doesn't run counter. I remember when there used to be battles between the uh, development agencies and the environment agencies because the one said the other didn't care about people and the other said the other didn't care about, the, uh, about nature. I, today, of course, both understand that uh, these issues are a threat both to people and to nature. It has brought a whole range of people together who really weren't there before. The difficulty is that if one comes to civil society, outside the campaigners, outside those who have a uh, moral or religious interest in this, uh, we have compartmentalised our reactions to climate change, and that we've done because it's convenient. Uh, it's very good in a government to say, oh, we've got a, we've got a minister who deals with this. So I don't feel that I've got a responsibility as Secretary of State for Health or as Chancellor Exchequer, uh, except when I'm asked directly for some money for something or other, but it isn't actually central to me. Now, that's the reason why the Climate Change Committee was uh, perhaps surprisingly very supportive of the nature of the clean growth strategy, because for the first time, 
a government was prepared to say this is at the centre of our industrial strategy and not some byproduct, something on the side. Now we shall see, of course, as we've made very clear, whether this is real or not. But it is certainly a move which is absolutely vital if we are to deal with climate change. Now what I like about this document is that it is reminding the Bank of England that it too has got to recognise that climate change is not one of those things that you can use as a compartment of the bank, something which you can stand up and point to as affecting international stability, but not affecting <coughs> international day-to-day -day financial transactions, which is where they are at the moment. And I echo um, uh, the comments, not only of the first speakers, but, but, but very much Barry's comments, that we do have to honour the um, Governor of the Bank of England, because he certainly <coughs> has moved this whole argument a very long way on. I wouldn't have thought five years ago that I could have stood up and said <coughs> the Bank of England's Governor is clearly on the same page as we are in the Climate Change Committee. Uh, the, least, the most I could have said in those days was that he hasn't actually said anything about it. Now we are in a position in which uh, he has recognised the fundamental <coughs> disruptive nature of climate change, this symptom of how much we have misused the planet that gives us life. So how should we think about the future as far as the Bank of England is concerned? Well, the, the first thing is... Um, I don't think it can any, any longer compartmentalise climate change. If it's true, and its governor says it's true, that climate change is perhaps the greatest disruptive force in international finance, then you've got to do something about it. And you see, the problem with climate change seems to me very simple. It is if we didn't know why it was happening, we wouldn't have any responsibility. People didn't know why the Black Death happened, so they didn't have any responsibility for one in three of the people dying. We do know why climate change is happening, and we therefore do have direct responsibility. And it's there when I really come and deal with the, uh, the prisoner's dilemma, uh, or indeed the argument that somehow or other we may destroy ourselves by dealing with climate change. I have to start by saying we'll destroy ourselves by not dealing with climate change. And there is no point in having all sorts of bits around it. That's the first point. Second point is, as Barry said, we have disconnected in Britain growth from uh, uh, emissions. Uh, growth of 64% emissions uh, uh, of uh, in, in increase of uh, early 40s, 42%, that, that sort of mix over 10 years. So we grow much faster than our emissions have grown. And that's a huge uh, advantage, and it's something that we can, if you like, sell to other people. We've grown that way because we have taken real measures. And, and, in, and they're good for everyone. I hate people, if I may say so, I don't hate people, but I hate people who say that um, what we really need is a good crash because the people who suffer in good crashes are the poorest and the least able to defend themselves. They are still suffering from the last good crash. So we have to try also to recognise that it's a terribly, a terrible comment about humanity that we aren't clever enough to know why something is happening and what you do about it. The comment about Her Majesty is absolutely true. Why didn't we see it coming? We do see this coming. And if we can't face up to it and find a logical, real, politically possible answer, then we're saying something about humanity which is extremely unpleasant. And therefore, we have got to find a way through. And all the signs are that the measures we are taking are not destroying the economy. I mean, I'll give you one single fact. We spend, the average person, 85%, spends £9 a month more on their energy bills in order to pay for the green crap. But they have an energy bill which is £20 a month less 
because of the effect of those measures and the reduction in the energy use of the equipment, the boilers, the toasters, and everything else that they have. So in fact, the measures we've taken, despite the Daily Mail, uh, in fact, I've always thought it's a symbol of what is right if the Daily Mail takes the opposite view. <laughs> despite the Daily Mail, the average family is 11 pounds a month better off because of what we're doing about climate change. There is no reason why these should be contrary. So that brings me to the three very short things I want to say about this report. The first is, of course, the Bank of England has got to take much tougher measures to integrate its acknowledgement of the danger of climate change into all that it does. There are several examples here, some of which I do agree with totally, some of which I would change in one way or another, but it certainly is number one. Number two is, we have to be a bit careful about demonising rather than encouraging. So I don't agree with the concept that you should uh, disinvest automatically from anybody involved in fossil fuels. I want to make a distinction between those companies that recognise that they are where they are now, but have to be somewhere quite different in 20 years' time, and they will take the measures to turn those great companies into something which will be suitable for a world that is fighting climate change. Now, if you look at the fossil fuel companies, uh, there are many in which I would not invest, because they are clearly still not understanding. Uh, ExxonMobil still doesn't understand. Peabody Coal still doesn't understand. But those companies that are seeking to make a change, we ought to be helping them to make that change because it's a very tough change to make. You built up a business when what you did was seen as to be morally extremely uh, advantageous. You land yourself with a business which now has got to find a new role. And if you're willing to take the lead there, I think you ought to have support. So I'm secondly in favour of the bank being much more determined to help those who are determined to change than they are at the moment. And the last thing I want to say is this. The bank has got to use its pressure upon government, because although it's owned <coughs> by the government, it is independent, to make the government understand that its decisions too have got to be in line with its commitments to the fourth and fifth carbon budget. I, I don't myself feel that the Department of Health has really understood what climate change means for the future health of the nation. I don't myself really feel that DCMS is making its decisions about the third of the nation's meals for which it is responsible uh, in a way which makes climate change central. Its discussions about digital what an awful word that is. Digital what, I ask. But its discussions about digital matters never seem to me to concentrate on climate change and the need to use the new technology to make it possible for us to dislocate, <coughs> disconnect uh, uh, growth from uh, emissions. Uh, the Department of Transport speaks with many voices but not with the single voice that we've actually got to meet carbon budgets statutorily and necessarily <coughs> without fiddling numbers. <coughs> so the bank can make a huge difference by using its own direct powers and also by influencing the government by asking these questions of it when it comes, as it does, constantly face to face with treasury decisions, decisions by ministers on spending. I leave with just one word of hope. In my business, which advises people on whole questions of sustainability all over the world, five years ago, you would find it very difficult to find a single venture capitalist, a single investor, who, unless they claim to be an investor with sustainability credentials who would believe that what we are talking about 
was a necessary part of investment decisions. I have to say now, I can't think of a major investment house that doesn't have this as a serious part of how it measures the management of companies that it intends to buy and how it then helps to train the management so that it can sell the companies at a profit. They all know that these issues are real measures of people's understanding of risk and preparation of <coughs> companies for the future. If that is true, then the Bank of England ought more than anyone else to recognise that this is a key indicator <coughs> of whether a business is doing the right thing. Not morally the right thing, although it is, but doing practically the right thing. Because no business will prosper if it doesn't recognise that climate change is happening, that the world knows it's happening, that the world is making not always the best, but certainly intending to make the decisions which will meet the challenge of climate change. And a business that ignores that will go to the wall. So if you want to be Kodak, if you want to be Arthur Anderson, if you want to be a business that was good once, the best way to do that is to ignore climate change. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. There's um, a, a great deal to, to think about there. Um, we're going to move on to our final response um, on the, uh, the report, uh, which is coming from Baroness Featherstone, uh, who is, of course, uh, the Liberal Democrat uh, spokesperson on energy uh, and climate change. And uh, the Liberal Democrats, obviously, as, as a party, have a great history um, on this subject. Um, so please give us your response. Thank well, you. thank you, and uh, delighted to be here today. You're right, we have a great history, and we had two great secretaries of state during the coalition government, both from the Liberal Democrats, and then they gave me the job when I can't be secretary of state. No power. But, very, very delighted to welcome to this report, and I congratulate Positive Money for such a comprehensive piece of work in an area where it's vital to make progress and make it urgently. Um, when I came into post as energy and climate change spokesperson for the Lib Dems and looked at what Chris Hume and David Davy had done, we were a much reduced force, so I was trying to think, how can I use my position for maximum um, influence? And I set out to, to, make, to position us, the Lib Dems, as going further and faster than any other party, and commissioned consultants, <laughs> produced a report, our, our our policy had always been zero carbon 2050. We've never done the work to substantiate that, and I, I quite like being evidence-based. So this report set out to do. It's published in the autumn. It's called Vision for Britain, Clean, Green, and Carbon Free. Um, and I'm delighted to see that Claire Perry has now asked more deeply than the Climate Change Committee to look at that. I'd like to look at what my report looked at it. Anyway, the thing that struck me most was given the signing of the Paris Agreement and given the Sustainable Development Goals, there was no visible, tangible feeling of a step change in anything that anyone was actually doing. And we had together with that the urgency of climate change, um, the mass opportunity of a world where low carbon products, low carbon services meant that the green economy is developing at three times the rate of the normal economy. And we were also massively under addressing the risks of climate change. And then, obviously, like everyone has said, I came across Mark Carney's work, and that absolutely crystallized for me where we needed to go next. Um, and the second part of the Lib Dem climate change work is exactly around green finance and sustainability. Um, I put on, we put on uh, an event at the Stock Exchange with Vince Cable quite recently called Making London the Sustainable Investment Capital of the World. And I had a recent debate in the Lords making the UK the sustainable capital of the world because I think that is both our opportunity and our necessity. Now, Mark Carney's work has made the world really sit up and take notice uh, in climate change and financial markets. And over the last <coughs> year, his ideas leadership has really been a game changer, focusing on the climate change agenda post-Paris. 
the bank is um, a key member of the Central Banks and Supervisors Network for Greening the Financial System, which is a great initiative, it's a European initiative, um, but it's unclear where it's going to actually make an impact. And in February 2018, the bank made a written submission to the UK Parliament Environmental Audit Committee, and the bank itself referred to, quote, the bank's effort to ensure ensure the transition to a low carbon economy is financed efficiently and prudently. So whilst this affirmation of the bank's role is important in itself, it actually has to do that, in my view. And I thought this report was incredibly helpful in pointing out the ways it would, what might make good on its promise. But it also opened up two fundamental issues. Whether the bank is taking its fundamental role sufficiently seriously, it's good to see that the bank, along with other UK authorities, is supporting the growth of green finance initiatives. But also, there is a real contradiction in their, in their in actions in terms of climate change. Uh, and the degree, I mean, I heard what Lord Deben says, and I always listen and agree with Lord Deben, in my interest to do so. Um, but the degree to which fossil fuel still seems to remain the dominant source of energy that is viewed as an investment. This is picked up in the report. It doesn't make any sense that the bank is recommending the task force on climate-related financial disclosure uh, and the disclosure by companies of climate risk, and TCFD includes those risks relating directly to fossil fuel. It doesn't make any sense that it's recommending that it be voluntary. Being voluntary sends the wrong message to investors. Voluntary will mean that those that are good will follow that route, but as the report calls them, the laggards won't be reformed. In our view, it needs to be mandatory. And the bank also needs to just encourage discussion towards weighting bank finance of fossil fuel activities and the use of a green supporting factor and or a brown penalizing factor. I think, yes, encouraged by all means those companies who are showing a bit of ankle on this, but they're not showing enough ankle and they need some, some forcing. Regulators can create a pricing differential between brown and green by increasing the cost of regulatory capital for financing brown and doing so on a risk-based argument that the risks associated with brown have systemically been underestimated. That there are going to be if companies don't move a number of stranded assets all over the place and that poses a great risk. The overarching point that the report makes is well made that a concern for financial stability looks incoherent over time unless it considers the long-term viability of the economy. And I would um, suggest to the Bank of England, the Financial Policy Committee and the Monetary Policy Committee that they read this report and take the advice in it seriously to move forward on those actions. We actually have the opportunity to make the UK the green finance capital of the world to, tell, to help tackle the challenge <coughs> of global climate change, underpin the decarbonisation of the UK economy itself, necessary to uh, future growth and to bolster the position of the City of London, particularly after the B word, Brexit. UK needs a sustainable financial strategy, and just to lay this out very quickly, promote green finance through innovation in financial policy, including better flows of information through enhanced climate risk disclosure, both for companies and for flows of finance, action to support green bonds and fiscal incentives for green investments, mm -hmm. I'm afraid we're in a very, very fast race competition with a number of other countries in the world to, it, to, to move in this direction. And our government should be issuing a green sovereign bond as an indicator of its backup. But as, as Lord even said, we're not sure how much backup is actually there, having read the clean growth graph myself. Expanding the level of green finance through increased levels of infrastructure investment underpinned by an ambitious and stable policy framework. The establishment of a British housing and infrastructure investment bank replacing the Green Investment Bank, which should never have been sold off, and through mainstreaming, green policy aims into institutions and sources of capital, and developing a broader range of activities, including green mortgages, exploring the role of the insurance sector, including, for example, offering energy efficiency insurance and of alternative um, finance. I have to say, I think energy efficiency should be an infrastructure priority. I think it has to be woeful in this country. And I think the removal of things like the zero carbon home standard is an absurdity. Anyway, I hope that the Bank of England and other central banks and financial institutions read your report, Positive Money. Well done for driving this agenda forward. Thank you. Thank you very much.
much for that. Um, right, well now we've got an opportunity for more uh, questions to our panellists uh, and we do have set some microphones uh, around. Um, we've got a little bit more time so probably we can use them. There's a gentleman here at the back. Um, can I ask you, when, you uh, when you're called on to ask a question or, or make a, a comment, if you could be concise and brief as we'd, we'd like to get as much in as possible and if you could also, uh, when you stand up, if you could tell us just your name, and uh, if you have a particular affiliation uh, to a, a group or organisation or, or company or whatever, um, do, do let us know if you have one. You don't have to have one. At the back there, please, first. Hi, um, my name is Sadr. Would you mind standing up? I think it'd be easier for us to... Thank you. My name is Sadr. Um, I'm self-employed in uh, doing research in environmental um, sort of problem areas, but also solutions. My, um, <coughs> I've just written down a few quick points just to make it quicker. Um, in terms of um, carbon containment, uh, a lot of people are talking about that, but the one thing that seems to be missed, at least across the UK, um, and this is something that is evidently sourced or started in Sheffield, is the trees across the whole of the UK, mainland at least anyway, thousands of them, <coughs> are being chopped down. Um, and that's been written about in articles in newspapers because the mobile phone companies need a better reception. Now, in addition to that, uh, people are talking about the uh, clean green energy, but the clean green energy requires the banks to fund the mining companies. The mining companies need to mine the minerals that are required from other countries. And my question is, that how much of this vicious circle that we are creating ourselves are we heeding when the scientists worldwide in proven journals are actually saying that the increasing amount of radiation from my phone and also the, um, the monitor that the police wear above their heart as well is actually causing cancer. So what are we really actually solving when the people who are actually using the service are actually just dropping like flies. Um, I think this is something that really needs to be addressed. And I've found that the people in Parliament, when I've spoken to them in the last few months, they actually don't know the dangers of Wi-Fi themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Uh, we've got a question at the front here from, from the guardian. And I'll take you and you as well. Hi, I'm Randy Ramesh. Uh, as Gary said, I work for the Guardian. Um, I'm the chief leader of I was interested um, that the politicians avoided perhaps the most radical proposal in the report, which is over monetary financing. This is a policy that would change fundamentally what the bank does. It doesn't mean should we end the issuance of public debt, risk free instruments for the financial sector to disappear. It provides inflation risk that need to be tackled in a different way. But it also suggests that politicians rather than financial indicators would be used for investment. It's a pretty big change, I would suggest, for most people involved in politics today. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't hear an answer to that question. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. Um, I'm sorry, we have a question. Oh, here. Thank you. Hello. My name is Remo. I'm with Finance Dialogue. Um, my question um, was not something that Ms. Bellister mentioned, which was, the green supporting factor from penalising factor, and I was interested to hear from the panel what you think are on each individually. So, yeah, can, can, you, you, yes, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah, so in the, the middle. The, there's a debate about whether in capital requirements for banks um, there should be a green supporting factor or a brown penalising factor, or as I still mentioned, maybe a combination yeah. of both. I'm okay. uh, interested to hear on each individually panel things. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to have a question at the back if we could have the microphone down there. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Alex White from the Orders Gateway. I just wanted to know, Rob, if you've had a chance to talk to the Bank of England, and if so, if they've had any reactions to the feasibility of this, or whether anyone else on the panel has had these sort of discussions and what the practical implications of this might be for them. Thank you. Thank you. A very concise question there. And, um, I, I want to take uh, one more, um, just one, I, I think you've had your hand up. I'm talking to 
contrast to the financial science. Um, looks even you it's easier to hear if you wouldn't mind standing. Um, it would even you make lots in reference to the ambitions of the clean growth strategy, but it's been accompanied by big cuts in subsidies for clean energy and quite big falls in the amounts of money going into those technologies. What do you think the gaps are there in fact should they be filled? Lovely. Thank you very much indeed for that question. Thank you. So we've got uh, that question on the, um, uh, the green growth and the, the funds, um, uh, questions on, on penalising and support on monetary financing, and uh, the question over here um, about the, uh, the vicious circle. Sometimes. <coughs> I'm going to give you your chance first, Rob, as Thank you were the author of the report, and some of the songs. You, do you don't need to answer every question. <laughs> uh, just shall I respond to one and then the yeah. others respond to the same question, or shall we do? Shall I speak on all of those? Then? Just I'll do whatever I want. Do what you want. No, no, no. Whatever you feel was, was, was the Absolutely. most important right. question, the most relevant to you. Okay, well, I mean, I can get back to these ones about the specific policies, uh, first of all. Um, let's go with the green supporting factor. So just to clarify for everybody, this is the notion that um, because banks have to hold a certain amount of capital when they make a loan, and this is a capital requirement, and this is a part of financial regulation. So there's been a proposal that because... Um, high carbon assets are riskier, they should have to hold more capital because if there's a higher chance that, because of all the risks that we've been talking about, um, the loan will go bad and then they'll need to have the capital there. So compared to low carbon. And the green supporting factor is the idea of making the capital requirements for, for green projects lower. The brown penalizing factor is the idea of making the capital requirements for really high carbon projects higher and keeping everything else the same. Um, this is kind of a relevant discussion because um, at the EU level, the green supporting factor has been discussed quite favourably. Um, but in the report, we discussed that there are some big problems with the green supporting factor because really we've spent the past 10 years trying to shore up the financial system against extra risk and trying to protect banks from seeing the same kind of thing happen again. And to then strip away capital requirements really feels like a quite misguided policy, um, especially because lots of the, this is, a very, this is a very novel topic, and lots of the types of risk that we're talking about are still quite poorly understood, so it doesn't make much sense to go um, allowing banks to make much more favorable loans, or favorable to them, um, to perhaps green mortgages, which it's not clear are actually any systemically less risky than um, the normal mortgages. But the brown pea money, on the other hand, is, is, has, it doesn't have those downside risks to the policy, you see, so it's, it's less. We come out in favour of that. Sorry, we come out in favour of that in the report. Um, on the talking, have we talked to the Bank of England? Um, yes, we started this entire process really with uh, talking to the, the unit inside the Bank of England that deals with the climate stuff and that published this quarter, quarterly bulletin article um, that was briefly on the screen. Um, and the impression, I mean, they were very, very helpful, and but they are, they are working within the Prudential Regulation Authority, and they're concerned with supervising the entire financial system, trying to understand some of these very complicated things. How do we measure the risk of car carbon assets? Um, and so I suppose, understandably, were a bit, uh, they weren't too pleased to be told that they should be doing more. Um, but I wouldn't just go so far, go so far and say, oh, they're wrong. It's, it's, the, the, the reasoning behind this entire report was that, well, we were trying to look at why it is that, why it is that the central bank community at large kind of reacts to this in this way and then steps back and says did, we shouldn't be doing more. And I agree, I would really echo the praise for um, the Bank of England and for um, Governor Mark Carney and all the officials that have given speeches on this. It's, it's great that everybody is suddenly talking about this. But there's definitely a cognitive lock when you start talking about raising investment. They are very on page with the, with the risk, and that's why the unit, the climate change unit, is almost siloed within the PRA inside the bank. But there is no way that those messages on that risk are getting across to the monetary policy. Um, side of what the bank does. And in fact, in Governor Carney's speeches, he says, I don't think it's appropriate that we should really compromise the bank's normal thing, way of, or its monetary policy or its financial regulation. We shouldn't make those things, we shouldn't change those things along climate lines. Um, 
which goes completely against the spirit of what I think both even and other speakers have been saying. Um, and the high truth thing is that we should put sustainability at the centre of, of the entire effort. Um, and finally, I'll talk about the uh, monetary financing. Thank you for that question, because it's, it's obviously the boldest thing that we put in the report, and it's something that, of course, the money we argue for and we're strongly in favour of. Um, and there are definite synergies between the need for green investment and a reimagined role of monetary policy where it's, it's not just... Uh, it's not just interest rates and it's certainly not just bond purchases um, of the traditional quantitative easing type. The problem with monetary finance is that it does require an, a level of coordination between fiscal policymakers, the Treasury, and monetary policy, policymakers that hitherto is, is just unknown. And in fact, since the financial crisis, we've seen quite the opposite, where the bank's monetary policy is favourable to fiscal policy makers to be able to do some spending, but because of the delusion of austerity, we haven't seen the um, accompanying increase in fiscal spending. So there's a lot more institutional frameworks to be worked out, how monetary finance would interact with the Treasury, how that <coughs> dynamic would work, and that echoes in lots of the other work that we do at Positive Money. And so the, reason, the recommendation we make in the report is that the bank should start thinking about how new, new monetary policy tools, which it sorely needs, would interact with these other um, objectives, especially climate objectives, as a first step. So thanks for raising it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for those replies. Uh, Baroness Fergusson. Well, I was just going to just briefly comment on the, the re precipitate removal of the renewable subsidies. I, I think that sort of sent a shockwave through investors and confidence. And I think it was a great mistake of the government to have done it in that way because so many um, businesses in the solar industry and others had um, got their business plans together based on a set of goalposts that were then moved entirely and it undermined, and I think the solar industry lost a huge amount of jobs and has caused a great deal of uh, investor wariness at a time when there is a lot of money looking for a home, swimming around the world looking for investment, but there is a great nervousness about actually putting that money into the projects because the government is very unclear. And in, even in the clean growth strategy, where it is talking a good talk, it doesn't have the sort of rigor of a delivery plan on any of it. And I think that makes people very nervous. Thank you very much. Uh, Lord Deben. Well, I don't want to miss the word about trees in the first place. First of all, uh, there, there are a number of examples where people are cutting down trees which are busy fighting. The fact is we are growing a lot more trees. We have a lot more trees to grow. Um, one of the things that the Climate Change Committee has clearly pointed out is that if we're going to have any move from 2 degrees towards 1.5, we've really got to take carbon out of the atmosphere. And that does mean a whole range of changes. And uh, we are just about to embark... Um, at uh, the uh, at a sort of joint agreement with uh, uh, Michael Gove on a uh, very serious piece of work on uh, uh, land usage and the whole concept of how we have to think about land in the future, which I think is a very, very fun fundamental thing. I have to say I don't actually agree with the um, comments that we are being fried by this stuff. I think that's a, a, a myth. Um, and, and that's not what one has to do. You, what you have to do is to do as my mother would say, the best you can at the time, dear. Uh, what I mean by that is, w this is an incremental matter, we have to make the increments much quicker than we've done before, but don't let's think you can get to Nirvana immediately. You've actually got to do these things um, as rapidly as you can, but recognise that the dislocation is a very serious matter for those who can least protect themselves from that dislocation. And therefore, you really do have to try to do this in a sensible way. Our problem is that that very often means that people don't move fast enough. So our pressure must always be to move faster. But just occasionally, in an audience like this, let's remember that these changes do have very significant social um, rea results which we are very bad at protecting people against, and it's one of our failings as a society. Now, um, I 
I'm here as chairman of the Climate Change Committee, not as a politician and certainly not as a defender of the government. That's not my job. My job much of the time is to uh, bring the government to, um, uh, 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 to book. And uh, as far as the um, uh, clean growth strategy, I've specifically said that its positioning and its, um, uh, and its vision uh, is something that we certainly need and should support. We then specifically said that its details are practically entirely lacking. So in the, at the end of June, as we have by law, we will be assessing how much the government has so far done towards that, uh, uh, towards the first stages of its clean growth strategy. And at the moment, I think that may be somewhat critical, but I haven't uh, uh, read um, our latest uh, version of that, and it will take us a bit of time, but I don't think anyone will suggest that we're going to be other than very, very tough on this. And uh, one of our problems is that the road to zero, which is a major part of this whole program, is, uh, has not yet been published, and we are not yet when it will be published. I don't think it's been uh, held up, I just think it's not been published. And of course, it, unless you get some real dealing with the whole issue of transport, transport and land use are the two big issues that we're going to have to face pretty quickly. And we're looking very toughly on that. Now, on monetary financing, I'm, I'm not sure one, one avoided it. Perhaps I used language which, um, uh, which was not satisfactorily neat, so I will, I will try to say it in a different way. Um, I, I do think that moving the way we do these things so that climate change becomes an essential part of the decision making that we're, that we're doing is essential and I think it's right for the, this report to have put it <coughs> like that. But I also note that the author is very clear about this. This is much more complex than you that, than almost anything else that Joyce, not, it's not only the most radical comment, but one of the things about it is it's the most complex comment. And, and we don't have any possible institutional arrangements to make this uh, a reality. So I don't think it's unreasonable, as chairman of the Climate Change Committee, to say this is clearly the direction in which we ought to be moving. I'm not um, uh, technically capable to say whether I think that what sort of new institutions and mechanisms we need to have. Um, it's an area which we're about to start some work on, not just this actually, but the financial implications of, of the fourth and fifth carbon budget, and this will certainly come up in, the, in that. But I don't think anybody should believe that you wave a wand and it happens, because getting the Treasury and the bank to come to a conclusion together about even the smallest steps has not proved terribly easy in the past so I, 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 don't want, I don't want that to be our main effort because if it is the main effort it's going to take us a very long time and climate change will have overwhelmed us it seems to be by the time we've got that deal done. I wanted just to say um, just one other thing um, I hope that we recognise that the reason we're talking about finance and the Bank of England is because it is extremely important and because it is what is going to drive things. But it is not because it is the only thing. And one of our difficulties is that we really do have to be much more holistic about the approach that we have to climate change. So it should be a question we all ask in every action we make, whatever that action is, because it touches every action. And I... Uh, of course it's right to come to the financial structures and say, you've got to get yourself in line with all this. As long as we do realise that we're doing that because they've been a bit behind, perhaps more than a bit behind, that's why we're doing it, but it's not because they're the only bit. The trouble with our society is that we need a holistic change in the way in which we think about these things. That's why my first quote was from Laudato Si, because what is so unique about it is that in a very short compass, it actually reminds us that it's about the decisions we make as to how we go to work, the decisions that we make about the poor, the decisions that we make about how we 
grow our food, the decisions that we make, how we treat our animals, all <coughs> those things are part of a holistic change in the way in which we look at ourselves and the world. And I do think we live at the most exciting moment of the last 500 years, because this is the, this is the real seminal change in the way human beings think about other human beings. It's the end of uh, imperialism, and we have been imperialists since the first village bashed up its neighbour for the grazing rights. And we've got to learn to live with other people, which is why Brexit is such a disgraceful scandal, and why it should be opposed by all of us, because it's saying, we can do things on our own and bugger you. That is exactly how the world has worked for far too long, and we need to recover, no, perhaps discover, a way of living together in a very, very different way. Getting the finance system to help that is a huge importance, but it's only one thing in a much bigger issue. Well, on that um, optimistic and, and rising note, um, thank you very much, uh, Lord Deben. Um, right, well, thank you uh, for your questions and, and your comments. Um, I hope you enjoyed the discussion. Thank you to our uh, wonderful panellists. Uh, they're a bit depleted now because uh, uh, two have had to, to go, but um, thanks uh, especially to Lord Deben and uh, to Rob uh, for the report itself. Thanks to Positive Money uh, for holding the event, um, and thanks to Catherine West, uh, uh, who was uh, introducing us earlier. There are refreshments uh, at the back here, um, and an opportunity uh, for you to discuss what you've just heard, and I think there are copies of the report as well. Um, so it just remains for me to say thank you to you all. Uh, enjoy the refreshments and the conversation, and uh, let's thank our panellists.